You've seen the big plays. Jaron stepping to his right, looking, looking, stopping, firing, end zone, touchdown! You've heard what the playmakers and coaches have had to say. Up for a three, got it! But now it's time to go behind the mic with BYU Sports Broadcasters to get their distinctive take on the games. Oh, what an aggressive play! This is Behind the Mic with host Cleon Wall. We're here to bring you unique insights and stories from the BYU Sports Broadcasters who cover the Cougars and from the Cougars themselves. On this edition of Behind the Mic, basketball analyst Kristen Kozlowski joins me to talk about the difficult task Amber Whiting has right now as the Cougars women's basketball coach and why it was important for BYU to hire a female for the job. Also a member of that team, Ariel Mackey Williams, stops by to talk about why she left her home country of New Zealand to play ball in Provo. As you probably noticed, I've asked our resident BYU broadcasters about how they got into sports media the first or maybe second time on the show. I decided not to change the formula when I invited Kristen Kozlowski to join me to talk about the women's basketball team. Kozlowski is a former Cougar Cager herself, and it wasn't long after her playing career ended that she started into broadcasting. So I graduated in 2005, got right into it. I think my first game was January 2006, had that opportunity. At the time, it was Jason Parker was the producer, and he had done a bunch of media interviews. When I was a senior, I was well-spoken and just kind of got right into it. Nothing I really anticipated doing, not a career path that I um, you know, foresaw for myself. I thought I would be a coach, uh, but very grateful that things happened the way it did. What was the most difficult thing for you transitioning from, I'm on the court, I'm part of the action, I'm doing what I can to win a game, to now I'm the one describing what's going on? Yeah, you you definitely have to change your uh, mental thinking of the game uh, from an athlete to more of a coach's view, I would say, as the analyst, and and seeing things that a coach would see or want to see in a game, uh, picking apart maybe defenses, uh, schemes offensively, what you're looking for, breaking down. Uh, I was very good as a player at breaking down film. Uh, I enjoyed that part of the game. I enjoyed uh, taking away the strengths of my opponent, you know, knowing personnel, all those things, keys of the game, things like that. But it was just a whole nother level when you're talking about it for a full two hours, about a 40 minute game. Uh, it, it definitely was a change for me. Uh, but I also think that that it has allowed me on the positive note to stay connected to the game. I've loved being able to stay connected to the game, stay connected to coaches, to players, still be involved at a level that I'm able to, even though I'm, I'm, you know, a mother of five and have my plate full. I just love that I'm still able to be connected to the game, but not as an athlete. Okay. You talked about how you like to break down film. How much work do you put into preparing for a basketball broadcast, whether it's for BYU broadcasting for, or, or for other media outlets? I would say I'm an over-preparer. Um, I was that way as a player as well. I'd like to be in the gym more. If I was struggling with something, I will, I'd always over-prepare myself for a game. Uh, so on the broadcasting side, I if I've got one game, I'll put in anywhere from six to ten hours of prep work. That may be more if you consider watching games, learning from other analysts. I am constantly doing that, whether I have a game coming up or not. Uh, I like to be a student of other analysts that I really look look to as uh, kind of mentors. Holly Rowe was one that I got to work with early on, and, and she's more of a sideline, but she does do some analyst work with the Jazz currently. And so I look at her. I look at Debbie Antonelli. I love Doris Burke. Some of those main stays in the game on the women's side that I really look to, I'm constantly studying them. But when I'm narrowing down pre- preparation for two teams, I'm typically about six to 10 hours, and that includes breaking down my board, putting in stats, putting in the names, knowing their height, the year that they are in school, where they're from, any key things that I can help paint the picture for a game. What was it like doing your first game? Did you have butterflies? Were you nervous? (laughs) Was it just like, oh my goodness, what is this all going to be like? You've heard the saying, deer in headlights as broadcaster and and knowing when that camera and the lights come on, uh, that feeling. And that literally was what it was. We were standing, holding the mics for our stand-up. It was Holly Rowe and I. She was the very first one that I worked with. And deer in headlights. I mean, I just kind of froze. Your mind goes blank. I I don't think you prepare for that because you've studied all of these, this information on teams, all the stats, you have it broken down on your board going into the game. But when you're up there in front of the camera and you're just having to talk, sometimes it, it just gets to you. Now I'm more versed in it. Now, obviously I'm a little bit more seasoned, uh, but those, those first few games were definitely harder to come by in terms of gathering my words, gathering, you know, my clarity of thought. It comes a lot more natural and easier for sure now. I was going to say, it it would seem like to me also, because of all the preparation that you do, that 
you'd probably go into a game now and you're like, okay, I've studied what I need to study. I know what I'm going to say. I'm fine going on the air. There Maybe there isn't any butterflies, I guess you could say, going I, into a game now. Absolutely. I, I think there are a little bit of butterflies. If I didn't get those, I don't know that it should be right for me to stay in this. I think that's the adrenaline and excitement that keeps me passionate about what I do. Um, Jeff Jadkins, who was my coach at BYU, longtime coach, he always said the minute you lose those butterflies is probably the minute you need to retire or be done. Uh, but that adrenaline that you get are those butterflies. And so I, I enjoy that. I do get it slightly, but definitely don't have the nerves like I used to. And, and all the prep I do, it's, it's kind of crazy because we talk as broadcasters. You do all this prep. You have this board in front of you. But you're not looking at that board very much. You don't have time to look down when you're calling a live action game. Um, So a lot of that prep really is just me kind of putting it on paper or typing it out in my computer, and it goes in my head. And so it's feeling that preparedness going into a game is really what just kind of helps me be comfortable and and feel confident. Let's talk BYU women's basketball now. Uh, They've had their share of struggles to start the season. But were you expecting it to be a season of growth since... Big time scores graduated. Jeff Judkins leads the team, leaves the team, and now they have a brand new coach in Amber Whiting. A lot of turnover for sure. Uh, I mean, you're losing a legend in Jeff Judkins, who's the winningest coach on the men or women's side, uh, a mentor to a lot of these girls that I think are still in the program. Uh, the newness of Amber Whiting, I've really gotten to know Amber Whiting and absolutely love her, and I think she's going to instill a confidence in these players that may take some time. Right? This isn't the same job. It was a year ago. Um, and so it's hard because, yes, she's a new coach. She had a lot of criticism, I think, early on. What do you, you know, straight out of high school, no college experience, we're bringing in this coach. But uh, the players that she has aren't the same players that were last year. Losing 71% of the offense with those graduating seniors, then also Shaylee Gonzalez transferring to Texas. Um, but with this team, as I look at this team, I've seen a lot of growth over the last couple of weeks and what they've been able to do in coming together and buying into this new coaching staff system. And so buying into what's asked of them. Sometimes you are uh, coming from a coach like Jeff Jatkins where he did it one way, but if you can't get on the same page with your new coach and your teammates, it's not going to work no matter what. And that's what we're seeing kind of unfold with this team. They're going to lose a couple more games probably before WCC, but if they can be working together, have that chemistry, and really be buying in to ways to win, then I think that we're going to see them do some good things in the WCC. Maybe not finish on the top, but at least compete for that. Give give a good competitive game to Gonzaga or Portland, those kind of two top teams in the WCC. I want to talk more about the team in a second, but I do want to ask you about Amber Whiting. And you mentioned how people were surprised that they hired someone with absolutely no college experience as the head coach of a major college program that's going into the Big 12. How surprised were you that Amber Whiting was hired? I was definitely surprised. I I think I had a few names in my head. Uh, Tom Homo did call me and kind of got my opinion on on thoughts of, you know, what direction should the program go? What do we need? What are we looking for? Um, And in talking to Tom, I think this is exactly who they were looking for. They were looking for a strong, confident woman um, that could come in and grow, not only in herself as a coach, but grow with the program as we go into the Big 12. And there's attributes about Amber Whiting that they were looking for in a coach, whether they had college experience or not. Um, and so that's what they went after. And I think that's what they got in Amber Whiting. And, and some of those things that I've seen early on and just getting to know her is just her drive to be the best and to help these players around her be the best with what they have, right? Because not everybody's going to be the fastest or the quickest or have the best shot or necessarily be the best dribbler. So you've got to pick your your moments to capitalize and maximize on the skill set that you have. And so, you know, in, in games that I've seen so far this season, She's not a zone coach defensively, but she's had to play zone against an Oklahoma team or, you know, just recently against Carroll College or we've seen them against Ball State. She's had to mix up what she's doing and adapt that to the personnel that she's had. And and those are things that college coaches do. And so I think that she's adapted very quickly to what is needed for this program and moving forward into the Big 12. How important was it that BYU, or maybe even just how important was it for you that a female coach was hired? Because you were under Coach Judkins. You probably had other coaches or been around your kids' coaches, and most of them are probably male. How important do you think it was that BYU hired a female coach? I think that was a priority for um, the athletic department, to find a female that would fit this role. Um, And I know that was something they were seeking after. It it wasn't a a given, right? We have to for sure have a female. But I I think that was high on their list um, in terms of relatability to the girls, in terms of 
a woman being at the head front of this position and being able to not only help grow the program, but for recruiting purposes, for moving into the Big 12, for the confidence, for for connection with these girls is so important. And, and those are things I've seen very early with Amber Whiting, all of those things in the connection, the confidence, having her be the face of the women's program moving forward. Um, I I mean, I can't deny that I was a little surprised that it was her because her name hadn't really popped in my head or circulated even in the media fronts. Uh, but then now that I've gotten to know her and kind of see, I think that shock has gone away and you're almost cheering for her. You're cheering for her to do well. You're cheering for this team to kind of come together because they they don't have a Shaylee Gonzalez. They don't have a Paisley Harding. They don't have a Tegan Graham. So you're almost more of uh, that why I really want to see this team su- succeed and take it to a level that maybe the expectations aren't there. Rise above those expectations. All right, let's get back to the team. Who is the leader on the floor? Or are they still searching for one right now? Uh, most definitely, I think that it's Lauren Gustin and, and Nani Falatea. Uh, Lauren is a little bit more vocal, and she's going to do it with kind of her leadership in terms of watching her and that example that she sets. Nani is not vocal, but Nani has the ball in her hands. And, and Falatea just has a swagger about her, a confidence about her game. Uh, she's smooth. She doesn't get too high. She doesn't get too low, doesn't get rattled. Uh, typically, you find your leaders are at that point guard position because they are handling the ball, because they're setting up the offense. They're also setting the tone defensively. So I think Falatea is kind of that go-to leader. But then also another name that pops up is Kaylee Smiler. And Smiler was one of those players that got minutes last year. Uh, she's more of a veteran on this team, one of the most experienced players on the team, even though they don't have a lot of experience, not one senior in that starting lineup. Um, so I, I think between those three, those are your three leaders that are kind of stepping up to the plate for this team. You may have already answered this question about Nani, but I, I wanted to go into a little bit more about her. I mean, she was on the team last year. She got playing time. But again, you mentioned the three people that she had to play behind this whole entire theme. She's only a sophomore. How do you think she's handling that role as being the primary ball handler on this team and still being, you know, semi young too. Right. And and in the games that I've seen so far and just watching her keep her composure, I think she's handling it perfectly. I mean, you're going to have, you're still going to have mistakes. You're going to have highs and lows. You're going to have losses. Um, But what I love about her is her constant, consistent, just kind of never rattled persona. And so when she's out there, that's what you need from your point guard. If they get too high, the team gets too high. They follow what you're doing emotionally. If you get, if she gets too low on herself, this last game where they played Ball State last Saturday, she did not shoot the ball well. I think made two shots out of about 14 or 15 attempts. Uh, not her best offensive outpouring, but she's a player that can influence the game in multiple areas, whether it's from her passing or her ability to push the ball in transition or getting back, making big stops, even rebounding. She's a fantastic rebounder bounding guard. And so all of that is leadership. You know, sometimes you think, well, leadership is just telling the other team what to do and keeping them on track, right? No, everything she does on the court in terms of her effort, her consistency, playing with a swagger, I think is one of the best leadership qualities she has is because she wants this team to play with a swagger as well. Like come out, believe in ourselves, have confidence in ourselves, um, And that's kind of the presence I think that Nani is for this team. Why is Lauren Gustin such a good rebounder. I mean, she's like a machine. We you can count on her getting at the bare minimum 10 rebounds every single game. Yeah, double double machine. She has seven double doubles this point in the season. Um tied for first in the nation in that category and she, you know, if you watch her, you can tell she's a gym rat, right? She just loves the gym. Physically fit. I mean, she does not get tired. She can play a full 40 minutes out there. Um but by having those attributes and those characteristics, you can tell that she's driven. Uh, driven in the gym and driven on the basketball court. And so when she puts her mind to it to go get that basketball, if you watch her, she's constantly working because she's going to get boxed out by one defender, maybe two defenders, but she's not going to stop when she gets bumped once or gets bumped twice. She does very well rebounding out of her area. So if she's up at the top, maybe at the free throw line, a shot goes up, she is moving to track that ball, whether it goes short corner or it goes on the block. She is going out of her area to get that ball. That's why she's hard to box out because she doesn't just move on the first or second attempt when you are physical with her. She continues to battle every single time. And she'll chase rebounds down that you think are going out of bounds. She'll chase it down and go, nope, I'm taking that. you know. And so <laughs> just the effort that she puts out there on the court and then constant endurance. If, if you're tired, 
you're not going to be a good rebounder. And that's not Lauren Gustin. She never gets tired. I know that Coach Amber Whiting asked her constantly throughout the games, do you need a sub? Do you need a sub? And she'll say, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I mean, it's it's rare that they have to pull her out of the game, and that's a good thing for this team because they don't have a lot of depth at that position. They don't have a lot of players that can rebound like her. So they're going to need her to play 37-plus minutes. Um, and to do that, I think Lauren Gustin, with where she's at in her life in terms of being in shape, this is why we're seeing her be able to play so many minutes, but then still continue to excel and and get those numbers that we're seeing with her double-double. What do you think's missing from her game? I would say the outside shot. And I know that's something that she's aware of as well. And the coaching staff is teams can just play in the paint, you know, defensively on her. They're going to, if she's out on the perimeter, even if she's setting screens at time, they're going to sag off of her, make her hit a couple shots, about 17, 18 foot range. She's not comfortable at the three point range. Um, so that would be the one area I think that, that needs to improve in her game. What do you think is the thing that BYU, what's the number one thing they need to fix the women's basketball team right now? I, I, I mean, I could give you my, uneducated response to it and it seems like they get a lead in every single game but they can't hold that lead and they let the other teams back in that's my uneducated guess on that what what would you say yeah i think you're correct in that there's a lot of areas i think that they can improve on one of which is closing games i mean they've been up there one and four when they lead at the half Um, so that's not a great stat they need to be able to close games that in turn comes with youth very young team not one senior in the starting lineup so this is a team that hasn't had to close games. They've been able to rely on Paisley Harding. You know, you go in ISO play and she can get a bucket for you when we're tied at the end of the game. So uh, the more game experience we have in those situations, you're going to maybe see them start to turn that corner. But the one area I think that this BYU team can control is the turnovers. Uh Early on, we saw a lot of turnovers that were losing them games, uh, scoring droughts because we can't get the ball where it needs to be or we're forcing it, trying to do too much. Live ball turnovers absolutely kill them, especially against teams like Oklahoma that runs the ball and, and gets out you know, very quickly in transition. So taking care of the basketball would probably be at the top of my list as something they can control in playing with pace but slowing down enough that you're making the right play and making a timely pass. Uh, they figured out that high-low, and I think that's where the turnovers were coming is trying to get Lauren the ball. But now the entry pass is coming from the top of the key into Lauren. A little bit easier for her to maneuver when she does catch the ball. Uh, but taking care of the ball will be crucial, especially going into the WCC. You're playing teams like Portland that are going to press you the entire game. San Diego, they hang their hat on defense. You're going to get pressured the entire game. It'll be crucial for them to take care of the basketball. Let's go from... Coach Whiting's first season as a college basketball coach to what Mark Pope is calling the grand experiment for the men's BYU, the BYU men's basketball program. How do you think it's going so far? Well, very different over there with the men's side, right? Because you had a big shuffling of sorts of their roster back in spring. I think there was a lot of question marks, like who are we going to get? He brings in some transfers and Rudy Williams, Jackson Robinson. Um, and you look at the men, and I think we saw a lot from them over the Thanksgiving break at that um, – battle for Atlantis, particularly in that last game against Dayton where they're down 23, they come back. I think they showed a lot of heart and a lot of competitive drive to win. Um, Early on, turnover is really killing this team. It's kind of like the women's side, right? Take care of the the basketball is the name of the game for both these teams. But if you can't take care of the ball, you're handing over possessions to other teams. So I think for this BYU men's team and what Mark Pope's doing, he is instilling in them the ability to be competitive in every situation, give themselves a chance. That's what you want, a chance, right? So even though they may get outscored for a six minute and have a scoring drought, they're still fighting and continuing to give themselves a chance in these games. They've been close in numerous games, not quite able to pull that off. That may be youth. That may be an experience. Some of these transfers coming in that blending right he's trying to get all of these players to blend together and figure out how to play together as a team I think three-point shooting has gotten much better I like to see Jackson Robinson out there knocking down the three Spencer Johnson also a big one for them but how about the freshman that he's brought in you know I think with all the question marks that we saw you know, who are they going to bring in? We saw transfers, but I've been so impressed with some of these freshmen coming in and Richie Saunders and Dallin Hall getting time and how they've been able to step up and been given their opportunities with Coach Pope having faith in them to keep them in the game at crucial moments. They played those three teams down to the Bahamas very tough. Uh, you know, leading at some points, trailing at some points. They played them tough. Do you think they have the makings of a second or a third place team in the WCC right now? Right now, No. But as we approach WCC, you got a whole, I mean, December, a lot of 
of practice time still to figure that out. A couple more games that I think where you can work that out. Uh, but by the time that we're in the end of February towards March, I think that they can really have an opportunity to be there. I mean, Gonzaga is going to be tough. St. Mary's is always tough up there. Um, BYU picked in the preseason to finish third right behind those two. And I just think this year, this team, there's a little bit unknown. Um, so they're seeking consistency, consistency to take care of the ball consistent leadership, consistent to shoot three ball, all of that needs to come together. And then I think they, they definitely have a great shot at finishing at that two spot, maybe the one spot. I don't know if there, anybody's going to upset Gonzaga. You know, Maybe there's one game that one of these teams may get them. So that's going to be a little bit harder, but give yourself a chance at that two spot. Kristen Keselowski, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. You have so much knowledge about the game that I don't have, so I appreciate you coming in and talking to us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was awesome having Kristen on the show, and we can't wait to have her on in the future, whether it's this podcast or other podcasts from BYU Radio. Coming up next, why Ari Mackey Williams decided basketball was best away from her home country of New Zealand. Welcome back to Behind the Mic. Before the women's basketball season started, I sat down with guard Ariel Mackey Williams to not only talk about her role on the team, but also about her journey from her home country to play hoops in Provo. I'm from New Zealand. I'm from Ngati Paro, which is the east coast of the North Island. Um, so that's areas like Gisborne, Tolaga Bay, Ruatoria, and yeah, just those areas. How many people stop you, whether it's on campus, Provo, anything like that, and just say, hey, can you talk to me because I love your accent? <laughs> um, I've actually gotten that like quite a bit, whether it's professors or like students in like the class and stuff like that. Like they always come in like, oh, where's your accent from and stuff. I'm like, I'm from New Zealand. <laughs> Definitely not American, but. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you end up here? Um, so. I guess with the whole recruiting process, I was in contact uh, with the coaches and stuff like that. And then, you know, when I thought about um, my colleges and stuff, I always had BYU in my mind just because um, it's a great environment. Um, you know, it's really safe and just like a whole fam- family environment. Um, family is very important to me. So I guess when I was looking at um, colleges and stuff like that, Uh, family and just being safe and stuff those were some of my priorities so yeah I think that's why BYU was a good fit and basketball too yeah obviously yeah that's it basketball (laughs) of course like no-brainer but yeah just more of like those three I guess were top ones for me were you always thinking of coming to the states or did you want to stay in your homeland Mm -hmm. um well I guess growing up and stuff so I guess uh, I'm I lived in Australia and New Zealand and stuff so Growing up, I was in, like, high performances, and they always talked about um, the pathways through college and stuff like that. And for me, I've always loved traveling and stuff. What about family, though? I mean, it's got to I, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I've been away from my family before, and mm-hmm. I get that, but I'm always like, oh, I'll, I'll, I can see him, you know, tonight or this weekend or next week or something like that. But you, it's like, mm-hmm. uh, when do I get to see my family next yeah. year? <laughs> yeah, so it's last year, I guess my freshman year was such a big adjustment, obviously coming into college and being away from my family. I moved to Melbourne when I was, I think, 16 for a year by myself just to get a taste of what college life's like. Um, but no, last year was definitely an adjustment, you know, being halfway around the world from my, without my family is a struggle, but I'm grateful that I actually have my auntie and uncle. They live in Saratoga Springs and stuff, so that helps um, going to their house on the weekends and then also just having, like, my teammates and stuff like that. But, yeah, it was an adjustment this year. I'm quite lucky because my dad has work schedules one month on, two weeks off, so he gets to come over, which is really really helpful for me because yeah family is definitely definitely big for me so yeah how long is that trip from here to new zealand um so from auckland to los angeles it's about i think it's a 13 hour flight and then from la here to utah it's about an hour and a half so roughly it's like a 15 hour journey like on the plane and stuff which is it's kind of long (laughs) yeah (laughs) You talked about the adjustment, just coming here freshman year, getting used to being in college, be, getting used to being in the United States. This season, another adjustment. Now you have a brand new head coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the some of your teammates who, that you played with last year who uh, put up a lot of offense production, mm-hmm. they're all gone. What's that adjustment been like? Yeah, it's definitely been a big adjustment, obviously losing our seniors and other players and having new head coach and stuff. Um, 
It's been good though. I think, you know, I'm really enjoying it with our new coaching staff and even just coming back with the girls and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, definitely now with the players gone, there's a lot of us players now who have to step up and um, have to take some of the roles that have been left from last year. So yeah, it's, I think for me personally, it's, it's an exciting opportunity that I'm really looking forward to. And I know that uh, a lot of the other girls are also looking forward to that opportunity as well. Are, are you thinking, well, this is it. You know, this is what I came here for. I'm going to get yeah. more playing time. Yeah, I, I learned from last season. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of your mindset going into this season? Yeah, I think so, definitely. Just, you know, last year with the seniors and other, the other players, like just learning a lot from them and just seeing, like, the games and how everything runs and stuff like that. And, and, you know, for me, like, this is what I've always, you know, worked hard for and stuff like that is playing in the minutes and in the big games and stuff like that. And especially, like, close games and, like, last quarters and stuff like that, those different scenarios is something that um, I've definitely worked hard for. And, yeah, I'm looking really forward to it. I would imagine that it's been interesting, difficult, maybe easy. I don't know. I, I, that's why I want to ask you. Uh, adjusting to a new coaching staff. I know you still have Coach Kamard here, but new coaching staff, Coach Whiting, what's that adjustment been like? Yeah, um, I love Coach uh, Coach Amber, Coach Whiting. She's been awesome. Um, yes, obviously, coming into the new season, it's been new adjustments and stuff, but she's been awesome. Her, uh, Coach AK, Coach Morgan, obviously Lee's still on the staff. Um, they've been really helpful and very, especially with Coach Amber, she's been very loving and very um, honest and just she's created the relationships with us, I guess, to just talk to her about things and feel comfortable with her. And I think that's really important to have that player-coach relationship. Last question for you. Do you, do you speak another language? Um, I can speak a little bit, a little bit of te reo Māori. Um, I would say, though... No, wait, what is, what is that? Explain that for us uneducated people who don't know what that is. So te reo Māori, it's the language of the Māori people, the indigenous people um, back home for me in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So I can speak that a little bit. Um, my older siblings, though, my, some of my other family members are quite fluent in that. Uh, but yeah, I can speak a little bit of te reo Māori. Do you ever fall back into that? Or, or you know, when you don't, you don't want someone to understand you or maybe anything like that, do you ever fall back into that and start speaking start speaking that uh sometimes i think for me though more i would say a couple like slangs or stuff like that like if i'm talking to kaylee i'll be like oh cheer bro or, like i'll just look at her and stuff like that or i always sometimes like if i see family here and stuff like that like i always give them a hug and say like kia ora or even seeing other um new zealand people or like any other polynesians or whatever around campus and stuff i'm always saying like kia ora hello and stuff like that and yeah. A big thanks to Ari and Kristen Kozlowski for joining today's show. Make sure you subscribe to Behind the Mic on your favorite podcast platform, or you can find all episodes of Behind the Mic on the BYU Radio app. Behind the Mic is a production of BYU Radio.